to do exactly that. Amen. Amen. I was looking over this outline, and I got to tell you, this is... Um, Whenever you see a lot of footnotes, that means like the nerd out was uh, on on like volume 11 out of 10. So I just got to tell you, I went down tons of rabbit trails, a lot of interesting things like, wow, that's awesome. And it has nothing to do with what we're studying. But I just thought that was interesting. So I tossed a lot of those things in there for you today. So if you're new with us, uh, interrupt at any time. We'll have time for questions, input, uh, times where I'm maybe a little blurry and you can help uh, teach me some things. And here we go. We're going to be uh, starting at verse 13. We're just going to read and see what God has for us. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? So Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but, uh, but my Father who is in heaven. Okay, so this, uh, this story begins at this specific place. Matthew wants to tell us the exact place. Uh, it's Caesarea Philippi. Uh, if you're taking notes, uh, one of the things that's about to happen is after chapter 16, the entire story is going to move slowly towards Jerusalem. And it's interesting kind of geographically because Caesarea Philippi is as far as you can go north in the land of Israel and still be in what's considered Jewish territories. This is as far as you can get without crossing into just explicitly Gentile pagan area. So that's where Jesus is. And in this area that is uh, kind of the convergence of Gentiles and Jews in the same place, Jesus has this very important dialogue with his disciples and ultimately with Peter. So let's break down what he says. So his question is directed at all of the disciples. And he says, who are people saying that I am? Like, what are people saying about me? So let's talk about these people for a second. The first is uh, John the Baptist. I'm just going to call him JB for now, just for saving ink. And then we have Elijah and Jeremiah. Let's talk a little bit about these three. Anything peculiar you see about these three, or why would it be these three? Any thoughts? Okay, they're all prophets. So there's something that people are recognizing about Jesus that is prophetic. What else? They all, have J in their name. They all got a J in their name? <laughs> nice. <laughs> they all got an A, too, if we want to play that game. <laughs> What's that? Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for keeping us on our toes, Jonathan. Uh, what else? Anything you can think of? Okay, in, in some people's minds, these two people are kind of more or less spiritually the same person, right? So that's kind of interesting. How many of you, when you read that list, you thought, why is Jeremiah included in there? Anybody feel that way? I immediately read that and thought, okay, John the Baptist, yeah. Elijah is like the superhero of the Old Testament. He runs faster than Usain Bolt and calls down fire from heaven, so he's awesome. Jeremiah is just like the crybaby who cries all the time and has like 40 plus chapters all about him. So what's up with him? Anybody else thinking that? Anybody want to just openly admit they had no idea that Jeremiah was a crybaby? <laughs> His nickname in Jewish circles is the weeping or the weepy prophet. Yeah. Uh, and that's because there's this scene. Um, I think maybe I made a note of it. Um, Jeremiah has this scene where he basically sits and looks over Jerusalem and he weeps and weeps and weeps for what it was and what it has become. So I think there's a couple things going on here. I think um, the idea that these are all prophets is definitely true. These are all also three uh, prophets that had a lot of pressure from the outside world upon them. So these are like very strong, combative, confrontational type of prophets. Does that make sense? So John the Baptist, what does he call people to? Okay, repentance. Uh, what does Jeremiah more or less do? Same thing, um, absolutely. And what is his situation? He's kind of, in his own words, he's like one of a kind. He's the only one left. We know that's not true. But he's basically positioned as one man speaking to an entire generation, right? 
So he's kind of the central figure of trying to call people back into obedience, which is the same thing for repentance. And Jeremiah also is taking place at this time where there's um, just great devastation over the land of Jerusalem and Israel. Um, they're going to be taken captive, and he's just weeping and weeping and weeping about what they have become. So, did you? Ha were you saying something? He just looked at me terrified. <laughs> she, I call on her. <laughs> okay, so we got these three. Now, this is, if you're keeping notes, this is actually semi-high praise. Would you agree? So if you're just doing a poll on the streets of, hey, have you heard of Jesus? Yeah, I heard about him. I heard him teach once. Who do you think he is? Wouldn't you say it would be pretty high praise for people to say, he's Elijah? Like, this is probably like Mount Rushmore of Old Testament, right? So this is semi-high praise. This is uh, glowing words to say about him. This is recognition that there's something powerful and divine in him. But is it the right answer? No. So Jesus takes a poll from his disciples. Who do they say that I am? And uh, these are some of the answers that they get back. Yeah. Why would they say John the Baptist when John the Baptist was alive at the same time as Jesus and they were with each other? It's a, it's a great question. I, I thought it through. I don't 100% I don't know. Um, I'm not 100% I'm not sure. I would assume that if, if they already, especially if they're from kind of the, the Pharisee school of Judaism, they believe in the resurrection from the dead. Um, and so if they do believe that Elijah and John the Baptist are the same person, maybe, maybe he came back to life. I, I'm not certain. What's weird about the idea of John the Baptist coming back to life is they existed at the same time, which is why I, I didn't come to that conclusion. Um, and that's just to say I came to no conclusion. I don't, I don't know. Uh, he said to them in verse 15, but who do you say that I am? Now, this is important. The word you here is plural. So he's addressing all of his disciples. Who do you guys say that I am? And, of course, the uh, self-proclaimed uh, uh, spokesperson for the group, Simon, replies, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Let's talk about this uh, statement here for a second. This idea of the Christ, I think, um, especially if you grew up in a household like I did, um, saying Jesus Christ was not just like a name that we say because we have faith. It was a curse word, right? And so we often combine these two and we think like, oh, his first name was Jesus and his last name was Christ. But that's not what Christ means. Uh, Christ is a very important word and it's a title. So what do we know about the word Christ? Um, it means well, Messiah. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, Messiah, I think. And let's talk about what the understanding of Messiah was. What was a first century Jewish understanding of who the Messiah was? I think it's in your footnotes if you wanted to cheat. <laughs> so this idea of Messiah... This idea of Messiah is sometimes, I think, misconstrued because we think, oh, Jesus was standing right in front of the Jews and they totally missed it, right? He was right in front of them and they missed it and they blew their opportunity and they just don't get it. But I think what's actually happening is that Jews were so like married to their idea of exactly what the Messiah was going to be and do that when Jesus didn't come and do exactly what they thought, they, they wrote him off. And I think they still do that to this day. So what was a Jewish understanding of what the Messiah would do? He was going to take over. He was going to get rid of the... Well, Okay, so he's going to axe Rome, and he's not just going to axe them, he's especially going to expel them out of the holy land, right? So Jews are going to get their holy land back. What else do we know about their understanding of the Messiah? Where is he going to come from? Who is he? What's his identity? Okay, so he's going to be a king. And he's not just going to be any, like, ragtag king, he's going to be a king in the line of David, David which is kind of a big deal. I'm stuck. So he's going to be like this warrior king who shows up and he liberates the Jewish people. Just, we follow him. Okay, so does Jesus come and expel Rome? No. no. Does he return the Holy Land back to the people? No. Does he come in the line of David? Yes. 
Does he ultimately defeat the enemy? Yes. So I would say that one of the problems Jews have is they have too narrow of an idea of what the enemy is and was. And they, they, they were expecting Rome to be destroyed. And in the meantime, Jesus defeats sin and brokenness and darkness. And they're left waiting for Rome to be expelled. So this, uh, this idea of Christ as the Messiah, the reason um, this uh, word Christ is, if you're curious, in Greek, um, it's like this. This is Christos, but this is uh, strangely in some like language juggling is actually the um, the translation of the Hebrew word, which is uh, Mishayek Mish or something like that. Mishayek is Messiah. That's where we get the transliteration straight to Messiah, but in Greek it's Christ. So very easily, if you just wanted to do like a Hebrew translation, instead of Jesus Christ, it could literally just be Jesus Messiah. And I think somebody told me that there's actually like a, um, like a Messianic Jewish translation of the Bible yes. that says this every single time, which I think is yes. kind of a, maybe a better way of understanding it. Okay, um, I think there's a footnote here. Uh, let's see, I want to make sure I know what it says. Oh, yeah, this is a huge deal in Matthew. Okay, we've had this, uh, this theme and it's going to come up here again. It's this idea of uh, Jesus wanting to keep his identity a secret. So I, I made a list here, and this might not be exhaustive. There might be a, a few more, and there might be some debatable ones. But so far throughout the, the, the Gospel of Matthew, there's only been a handful of people who recognize Jesus for who he actually is. And they proclaim it. So I made a little list here. These are the people. A Roman centurion, not Jewish. Two demon-possessed men in the Gentile pagan tombs. Remember them? Two blind men and a Gentile Canaanite woman. Pretty interesting. So it is not until we're over halfway through the way that Matthew is presenting the gospel message to us that even one of the disciples who have been following Jesus at this point, probably for two plus years, say out loud that this is who he is. Isn't that interesting? So what does Jesus say at the, uh, he's going to say it in the next chunk we're going to read. He's going to say, don't tell anyone. So we'll get there in a second. So he says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. Um, this idea of Barjona is uh, just son of Jonah. It's just, um, if you're curious what that was. Uh, just where my mind went, I couldn't find a connection, but did anyone pick up that last week the uh, Pharisees and Sadducees come before Jesus and they ask for a sign? Do you remember what Jesus says to them? He says, the only sign you're going to get is the sign of Jonah. And then Jesus, for the first time in all of Matthew, addresses Peter as, uh, what is it exactly? Bar yeah, Barjona. Son of Jonah, Simon Bar Jonah. And I thought that was interesting, and I thought, oh, that's got to be some connection. I got to figure this out. I, I couldn't figure any of it out. So if you have an internet connection and a couple commentaries, uh, you should go figure it out and then let me know what the connection is. I know it's got to be there. Like, why would Jesus go out of his way to say that after 16 chapters of never saying that? Um, okay, so for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. So, um, this is the same exact phrase, this blessed, and I think we hang around church circles for a long time and we read this word and we just think that's a Christian word and I get it. Uh, moving on. I think that would be a mistake because uh, in the Gospel of Matthew, this word does not happen a ton of times. So the the fact that Jesus chooses this word to say to, to Simon, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, is actually, I think, in some ways recalling the, uh, the Sermon on the Mount. You remember the Beatitudes. And how do all the Beatitudes start? Blessed, blessed are you. Uh, so I think there's an element here that, that Simon Peter is beginning to identify with the people that Jesus was pronouncing blessing upon in the Sermon on the Mount, maybe for the very first time. 
Uh, the, the other thing that I thought was interesting is um, in Matthew chapter 11, it says, At this time Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and the understanding and revealed them to little children. For that was your gracious will. I think there's an element of Peter, after being corrected and doing dumb things like walking on water, then sinking, and then thinking, oh my gosh, how are we going to eat even after Jesus has multiplied and fed 5,000 people? I think there's an element of Peter's character that is becoming uh, refined to the point where he is identifying more as a simple child that needs to just keep his focus on Jesus. And when that begins to happen, what happens is his proclamation is you are the Messiah. You are the Son of God. So why don't we pause for a second? Uh, why don't you turn to a, a few people near you? I put a little question. Um, who do you say that I am? So here's the, uh, the prompt. Just tell people the 30, 45 second version. What was going on in your life? What season of life were you in when you started to answer this question the same way Peter did? Or maybe you're not there yet and you're thinking, I'm kind of trying to figure it all out. So why don't you turn to each other? I'll give you a couple minutes and then we'll pass the mic and hear what a few people have to say. So I'm, I'm just curious. Um, I, I think there's probably some depth to some of your answers, but I think for the whole group maybe to hear, I, I think what might be interesting is why don't you tell us um, maybe uh, how old you were and maybe like a general stage of life. And then maybe the first person who could share, I would be curious if someone else would raise their hand and say, no, it was way different for me. I think, I think just hearing a diversity of kind of experiences of when God became real to us might be kind of a cool thing. So would somebody like to share and go first? <laughs> Does anybody want to say the sinner's prayer with me? <laughs> I would have pass it to Breck. Breck, you can just leave it on and pass it to whoever's next. Okay. So, and introduce yourself, too, so people know. Okay, so, uh, hello, is this working? Okay. Hi, YouTube. Anyway, uh, so I grew up in a Christian home, and uh, the church, uh, churches that we went to uh, basically professed and taught that we're all sons of God. And um, it wasn't until I was 51 when I started dating Debbie, kind of late in life, I came into a church like this, and I learned of the, the very clear distinction that Jesus is the Son of God, and we're and He's our Lord, and we follow Him. Hmm. Okay, so somebody who wasn't 51, I want to hear your experience. I'll share. Um, my name is Camille, um, and I think I shared a little bit on a previous night. I was raised in a Catholic home until I was maybe like 10 or 11 years old, um, and my parents were divorced, and my mom. Um, started dating our neighbor and got remarried when I was 12. So it was uh, kind of a really rough time, like a transition in our family. And she started going to church at the invitation of a coworker to harvest in Riverside. And she just took my sister and I with her. Um, so it was like a totally new experience for us. And we just kept going. Um, and she signed me up for winter camp because she wanted us to go. And um, I went up an altar call at winter camp because that was kind of the first time where I realized like okay everything around me is a mess but this feels real hmm. um, and then since then yeah it just, that, that was kind of the moment that I realized that he was real and it's been the same ever since. that's awesome awesome anyone else want to share oh all the way back there Marilyn is, is next Okay, I was 19 and a half. I was a hippie. I was working at a um, at the Wild West store over on Tustin Avenue. My boyfriend was there. There were a couple of Jesus freaks, a guy and a girl, constantly witnessing to him all the time. I guess I looked like a good girl and didn't need it, but um, I heard all of the Jesus stuff all the time. And then, uh, okay, I was not doing well at that time as a good little girl. So I went out to lunch and got high on something, came back into the store, and I thought I was in a Levi forest. And um, <laughs> it was like a Anyway, um, a customer reported me um, to the management. There was a girl on drugs in the men's department. I got fired. About three weeks later, I was going, those Jesus freaks are going to keep witnessing to my boyfriend, and he's going to get saved, and then he's going to dump me. And so <laughs> knowing everything that they had said, I just laid down one night and started praying 
what I'd heard, started confessing my sins. That went on for quite a while. And uh, <laughs> then it was going on and on and on. And it was just getting real. And then I just asked Jesus to come into my life and wash me clean and make me whole. And then it's like this whole heavy thing lifted off of me. I drifted off to sleep. And when I woke up in the morning, I got out of bed and I went, oh my gosh, I think I'm born again. I mean, I literally was changed. Wow. By then I'd gotten a job working for a Mormon, a Jew, and an atheist, so it was, it was perfect timing. That's, that's like the beginning of many good jokes, I think. <laughs> Does somebody else want to share one more? Maybe one more? David, I vote you. Oh, called out. David, you're being all day. <laughs> Growing up, I recall at the age of probably eight years, taking communion once a month in church, and the pastor would come, would be at the altar, um, and as he came by, he'd, he would always say, "We do this in remembrance of Jesus giving His life for our sins." You hear that once a month, eight to seventeen, and I understood it was true. Uh, one of the murals in the church was a mural of Jesus holding a lamb, saying, I'm, a, I'm the good shepherd. Um, and I think I understood it, that Jesus did shed his blood for me. But I understood it at a level where, I shouldn't say the word understood, I knew that he did that for a fact. That was true. But I didn't internalize it for what it really, really meant until I was 38, 30 years later. So it's possible to know that Jesus is real. He really did give his life for us. But until we internalize it, and that takes, an, that takes the experience. That takes the sinking to the bottom of the well and him dragging us out. But it was, a, it was at an early age that I'm grateful for, also because in, in growing up in a Christian family, a praying family, that being as rebellious as maybe a lot of us were growing up, we understood the truth. But even when it took time for us to recognize it. Hmm. Thanks, David. Take it. Awesome. How many of you feel like one of the four people who shared kind of uh, you resonate? Like that's kind of along the lines of my story a little bit. I think that's one of the coolest things about um, uh, Shameless Plug. You should watch the podcast. I think one of the coolest things about the podcast is you just meet all these people who are vibrantly on fire for Jesus and you realize the path that they took to get there are so remarkably different, isn't it? And it's just so cool to just hear the ways that God really can intervene and rescue all kinds of people at all times. Um, so you should check it out. Season finale launched today, Millie Britt. There you go. She tried to hire me as her press agent, but I said I got too much to do. Okay, we're going to jump to verse 18. And this is where the controversy begins, so get your pens out. Here we go. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. Okay, so reach on one side and the other and buckle up. Here we go. Here is the defining question that splits to... Uh, the two largest Christian factions in the entire world apart. And it is hinging on this. Literally. You are Peter, and on this rock, I will build my church. Now, there are only two things in the Greek language that this word can be referring to. And depending on the route that you take, you will end up in very, very different places. The first thing that this can refer to is Peter himself. So when Jesus says, you are Peter on this rock, talking about Peter, I'm going to build my church. Okay? 
So let's talk about this for a second. By the way, there's this really cool uh, wordplay because in Greek, Peter's word is Petros, and the word for uh, rock is Petra. And I actually think the ESV got it wrong because in a second, you guys, you guys already know what's going to happen. Uh, Peter says some stupid stuff and Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. You remember that part? And I, I, think, I think the ESV translated it as, uh, you are a hindrance. Yeah, you are a hindrance to me. But I think the wordplay is that you're a stumbling block. Peter and Petra and stumbling block are like, um, so the block that you trip over is also a rock. I think there's this like interplay going on and I think ESV blew it on that one, but. Okay, so let's talk about this. What is at stake if Peter is, the, is this? Who believes that Peter is this? Not raise your hand like personally, but what church movement believes that Peter is this? Catholics. Okay, so this is a very Catholic doctrine. And what ends up leading out of this doctrine if Peter is this? He is the first pope. That's correct. So the idea is that Peter is now the head of the entire church, that the church is built upon him. We'll get back to that in a second, but let's talk about the second one. The only other thing that this can be is Peter's statement that we just read. The statement is, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Okay, so this could be Peter's statement that Jesus is Messiah. Now, the implication is that if this is Jesus is the Messiah, then the church is built on the proclamation that Jesus really is the Son of God who takes away the sin of the world. Is that making sense to everyone? Now, you can already begin to see that when you make a choice, now grammatically it can be either one. That's totally true. But depending on where you land, you end up in a different orbit. Okay? So... The Catholic idea is that Peter is the first pope, kind of retroactively they put that title on him. He is the first pope. He is the bishop of Rome, which is the highest seat of the bishops, and it becomes the pope. There is um, something called um, papal... I can't remember the word. It's basically uh, how popes pass along their authority from pope to pope. And they actually uh, can track, some of it is historical, some of it might be a little bit more traditional, but they can track that uh, every pope since Peter has had the hands of the bishops laid upon them uh, in succession, and they know all of the popes, which is, no matter what you think about that, it's pretty good record keeping if you ask me, especially because some of them last like six days and get killed or something. So it's pretty incredible how well they've taken records. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about this. What are your initial thoughts? So the, the grand kind of arc of all the scriptures together has to somehow play into this, this. Okay? I agree with that. Anybody else? It, it just strikes me that where he says on this rock, like he's talking about Jesus being or himself being Messiah. He's talking about Peter, who are here, giving you the name. Then he says on this rock. He just kind of like, what does he mean by rock? And like, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so we can take the whole thing of Scripture, and I, I think, like, we don't want to necessarily play this game right now, because I think Catholics would say, like, sure, take the whole thing of Scripture. We have an explanation for that, too. We've thought of that also. But let's talk about a rock that you would build something foundational on. Can you think of any time Jesus ever said anything about uh, a rock for building purposes? Yeah, Wanda. Okay, the cornerstone. And who is the cornerstone? Okay, so Jesus is the cornerstone. I remember, uh, I think it might have been in this study or not that long ago, I, I looked this up. I was always taught that this was like the biggest, strongest stone, but it turns out that that's not actually true. What this is, is the most precise, perfectly cut 90 degree stone that every other stone is laid by this being kind of the, uh, the measure which I thought, oh, that actually may, adds like a new dimension of understanding. So if Jesus is the cornerstone, 
then I'm thinking it's a little weird to call Peter the rock, maybe, right? If Jesus is the cornerstone, is there any conflict with saying that uh, the rock is the proclamation that Jesus is the Messiah? No. Okay. So I think this is going to be a key. Now here's, uh, I think, depending on which route you take, the next chunk of verses all kind of play into one or the other. So let's see this. On this rock I will build my church. We're going to talk about that word in a second. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now verse 19. I will give you... Who's he talking about? Peter. The keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. It's a little strange that Jesus says this to Peter and then immediately seems to give him like an authority that the other disciples don't have. I, I think we have to acknowledge that that's in some ways accurate, in some ways true. But I, I think um, a couple things that we should know. I'm going to erase this just for, is everybody good if I erase this? Okay. Because this idea of binding and loosing, first of all, who on earth uses the word loosing? Honestly, if I just saw that word out of context, I would have no idea that that's even an English word. I've never actually heard anyone outside of the Bible say, I loose you. Nobody else? Okay, let's talk about binding and loosing. Because it turns out binding and loosing is not just like some generic words that Jesus chooses. This is actually a uh, rabbinical phrase. This is rabbi speak. This is Jewish rabbi speak. And it's rooted in somebody who has the proper interpretation of the scriptures. So the idea of to bind and to loose is uh, a way that it means that the person who is capable of binding and loosing is somebody who is capable of making the proper interpretation of the scriptures. So they can bind up interpretations that have no business getting out into the world and they can loose or let go the interpretations that are good and solid. Does that make sense? So this idea of binding and loosing, so he says to Peter, Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. I think what he's getting at is, is Peter, as long as you are part of building this church on the statement that I am the Messiah, you already have the keys to interpret the scriptures properly. Does that make sense? Any scripture that is interpreted in any way that leads anyone to believe that Jesus is not the Messiah should be bound. That's not a proper interpretation of the scriptures. Any scripture that you read through the lens of Jesus is the Messiah, the one and only that can save you from sin and brokenness, that interpretation is to be loosed onto the world. Does that make sense? Isn't that cool? Um, I think I've known this, I, I, I read this and kind of wrestled with it before we started Matthew, but just a handful of months ago, and I, I sort of felt like, how come no one ever taught me that? How many of you already knew that, by the way? Oh, good. Where were you guys like six months ago when I felt like an idiot? <laughs> okay, so this, uh, this theme continues, because uh, let's back up here. He says, on this rock, so if we're going to say, I, I think the majority of evangelical Christians, non-denominational Christians, and most of the denominations believe that, uh, that Jesus is talking about the phrase, that's the rock that Peter is going to build upon. He says, whatever he's building, we're going to talk about that next, that's that word. Uh, the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, this is not controversial, but there are two kind of competing interpretations of this gates of hell. Let's talk about that. There are kind of two main interpretations, and I personally don't think there's a problem with holding both of them at once. The first one, uh, gates of hell, is this idea that in the ancient world, when you fortified a city, and you built walls, you had to have some way for people to get in and out, and so there had to be a gate. When a competing military came to fight, the first place they went, the weakest point was the gate. Okay, so the idea of the gates of hell would be that this thing that I'm building, the weakest point cannot stand against what I'm building. 
Does that make sense? Okay, so uh, this is like a literal gate. And Jesus is just using something that everybody would have known. I think that's fine. The second interpretation is also even more of a literal gate. Some of you have probably read this before. There were uh, areas throughout the Roman Empire where Rome uh, had discovered spaces to the underworld. Have you heard this before? Basically, they, uh, they gated it off, and there was a spot. Um, you should look it up. Um, I think this is hilarious. The one closest to where Jesus was at the time was called the Plutonium, which I think is great. It's like, uh, it was named after the god Pluto. Basically, it had so much CO2 emission coming out of it that they would bring animals inside and they would drop dead. And so it was this idea of if you continue down there all the way down, you're going to get to this underwater cavern that leads deeper and deeper and you will go all the way to the bottom, to the depths of the earth, and you will go to hell. By the way, this word in Greek is Hades. Hades in Greek is the same as the uh, Hebrew word Sheol or Sheol. And this is not so much like the burning fire of flaming hell that we usually think of, like Dante's Inferno. This is the place where like evil and darkness lurks and is trying to snatch you. And so this interpretation of an actual gate is things die when they get close to that. So the idea is that Whatever's down there is trying to snatch you, but as long as you belong to this thing that is interpreted as the church, then the gates of hell can't prevail against you. So I think both, just combine them together, one single ball, I'll take that. I think that's a really cool thing. Okay, the last thing that I think is amazing about this chunk of scripture, just like two or three verses, isn't this so fun? I always wonder, we brush through all of this and we try our best and then we get to these spots and we like stay for a while. But I just have this hunch you could do this with every verse in the Bible if God just gave you eyes to see. I wish I just had more time to like finish Matthew and just start again. But I have a feeling people are going to uh, push for a new book of the Bible next. Okay, so he says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom. I think this is... Um, this is uh, 100% related to the binding and the loosing about like you can unlock and let something go free if it's wholesome and good. Uh, but the idea of giving uh, keys to someone I think is um, it's handing over authority. Uh, I think it's similar to, uh, you know, like, like cities will give somebody the keys to the city. When I was a kid, I always thought, like, that's not a good idea. They can go anywhere they want. I would go to GameStop in the mall. But, like, you realize that's not what it is, right? It's a symbol of you are being conferred authority that, you know, you care so much about the city that this is like a representation of that. You guys know what I'm talking about. So the idea of keys is conferring authority. And if we're following in the scripture, I think Jesus is saying, because Peter, you said it correctly, you now have the keys to understanding the scriptures. Now, this is important because up until this point, who has the keys to the scriptures? Jesus. Scribes and Pharisees. And how did they get the keys? They studied, yeah. They were smart, right? They were smart people. They were educated people. There's a, a piece of becoming a scribe or a Pharisee through the education system that sometimes goes overlooked. And that's, um, you kind of had to be a family of means to be able to send your kid off to just go follow a rabbi for a bunch of years, right? So you had to be like somebody of like means or status in some way. This is revealed by flesh and blood. And God, Jesus says to Peter, this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood. This was revealed to you by... My father who is in heaven. Father in heaven. Okay, so this is who has the keys. And... If we're just following the theme, it seems an awful lot like the interactions Jesus has been having. Like he's been like, oh, that's funny. You don't even know how to interpret your own scriptures. I'm not giving you any sign, right? In some way, Jesus has kind of like metaphorically grabbed the keys. And now who is he handing them off to? A poor 
uneducated, probably stinky because he, I'm going to put stinky in there because it just adds to the cause, right? Fisherman. This guy just got the keys to interpreting all the scriptures, and he got them, not because he studied, not because he heard a really good teaching even by Jesus. He got them because the Father in heaven revealed it to him, and he proclaimed it. Is that, everybody following? Is that cool? No, of course there's going to be a clash, because what are these people going to think of that? Yeah, they're not going to take too kindly to that. Okay. Then he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ or he was the Messiah. This is, uh, again, um, scholars call this the messianic secret. The idea is pretty simple. It's that Jesus wants people to come to this proclamation of faith based on their own faith, not because somebody convinced them, hey, if you say this, he might do a miracle for you or somehow you can talk people into A plus B equals Jesus died for your sins, right? That there's an element of faith. I think that's maybe one thing that sometimes like, um, like evangelical efforts when we try to go out and witness to people. Sometimes what, what gets wrong is you proclaim the message, you plant seeds, you do everything you can to water it, but the harvest is not up to you. Sometimes we step in and say like the harvest is definitely up to me right now. Sinner's prayer, yes or no, right? And sometimes we forget that this is at the core. Jesus wants us to proclaim this message to be true. The evidence should be our lives, as we've been learning for 16 chapters, and the rest is up to God and that person coming to faith. Okay, that was a ton all in one place, so let's talk about the last thing I think we need to cover. This is this word church, which in Greek many of you have heard. It's ekklesia. And that's what this word is, ekklesia. So, uh, ekklesia is an interesting term in like theology nerd speak ecclesiology is the study of all things church but the reason i wrote this in greek is important because this in greek when a word starts with this this is a prefix that means uh out of ek so at the core we just throw this word around church but what this really means is a uh, called out community or a called out gathering. Um, I think I wrote down a couple other definitions in my outline. Let me find them. Um, maybe not. That's okay. So this idea is a called out community. Well, technically it's a called out of community. So let's talk about this. At the core, what is church? It's a called out of community. What is church called out of? The world. When everybody says it at the exact same time, I I don't always hear it. Okay, called out of the world. And what about the world? Sin, darkness. Now let's think of it in context to Peter's statement. Let's flip back over here. Uh, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. So if this is the key to being part of this, what are we called out of? We are called out of death, for certain. I think, just as simply as we can put, we are called out of anything and everything that promises to save us other than Jesus. So we're called out of trusting ourselves. We're called out of trusting money. We're called out of all of these things to save us. And to be part of this community is to say, the only thing I believe can save me is Jesus. Because I proclaim with Peter, and I recognize that the entire church is built on this one statement. And the statement is... Yeah, you are the Christ. You are the Christ. Jesus is the Messiah. Now, what's interesting is Jesus is not a Messiah. The definite article in Greek is he is the Messiah. So that's what you're proclaiming. Okay. Um, Yeah. One question. Uh, Was it... 
the very beginning, we were talking about uh, the Christ and how the Jews understood the Messiah. Did they also believe he, he was the Son, not Jesus, but did they believe that the Messiah would be the Son of God? Like, uh, oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, um, yeah. I'm sorry, I forgot this. Who's going to be a human who's going to rise to power? And I think the latter. Uh, they thought he was going to come out of the genetic lineage of David. But Jews, this is interesting actually, Jews believe that there were other messiahs, but they believe there was one that was the, like the supreme messiah. So they actually have previous kings that maybe like fought off battles that, um, I'm trying to think of one, that they referred to as a messiah, like a figure that God brought onto the earth to rescue them from their enemies and return them back to peace. But that was like situational and they believed there was going to be one single one that would sit on the throne in Jerusalem and he would be the Messiah that would eternally return the land and everything promised to the Jews back entirely to them. So he was the, the, the way they saw the Messiah. I think they would say he was like, um, like he was called in to something divine, but he wasn't born as, as God. No. Which is, frankly, that is the biggest hang-up for Jews, because they would say, well, we're monotheistic. And we would say, we're monotheistic too. And they would say, wrong. How do you believe Jesus is God, and God the Father is God? I'm like, oh, that's the Trinity. And they're like, that's, that's tritheism. That's, not mo that's one of their biggest beefs. So. I, I thought that kind of too, another interesting thing is not only he acknowledges Jesus as Messiah, he also refers to him as son of God. Yeah. Which is kind of maybe two different things. All right. Maybe two different things that you didn't necessarily. Yeah. yeah. The son of the living God. Yeah. Um, sometimes Jesus uses this, this phrase, the son of man. Um, I don't know the full depth or breadth of that term, but a lot of people say that that is kind of the phrase used to describe Adam before sin. The son of man is the pre-sin Adam. He's the perfect, ideal human being created in the image of God. So it's kind of an interesting. Peggy, did you want to add something? Yeah, that word living is really important because they were living in a very paganistic place where there were other gods. And to speak that he was the son of the living God is, is what you have up there. Mm. Calling out of darkness. Uh, the, 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 this statement that he is the son of the living God and death cannot conquer him. Yeah. The gates of hell. And hell means death. Yeah. Hades means death. Sheol means death of yeah. the lost souls. That cannot conquer the son of the living God. And anybody who follows him, they are removed from that. Yeah. And that cannot conquer us yeah. anymore. Because we've been delivered of that. And he has the keys of death in his hands. Yeah. I, I love that. I love that we can, I mean, this is how we're supposed to do Bible together, because I was like so excited about like the word church and the gates and the keys. I didn't even pause to once ponder a living, which is kind of embarrassing to say out loud because I'm up here teaching you the Bible. But I 100% uh, I, I agree. And now I want to go back and do a little word study. Yeah, that, that word is important. It's not just you are the son of, the, of God, but what he says is you are the son of the living God. He recognizes something that... I certainly didn't catch. I, uh, full confession. This is week, what is it, 27 or something? I, I have to say to all of you, I appreciate you so much. When I first started doing this, I had transitioned out of youth. And I was terrified of you. Did you guys know that? I feel like when you're up there on a Sunday, like people can't talk back at you and be like, well, what about this? And I bet you didn't know that. So like the first six or eight weeks, I was like, I, I was telling Danny today, like just over preparing like crazy, like trying to anticipate every question. And then I just came to this conclusion that it doesn't matter what you do. You're just never going to be the smartest guy in the room. So just stop trying. So I, uh, I accept the living God and I fully acknowledge I totally missed it. So thank you, Peggy. Um, we'll finish this section with um, this is one of the commentaries I was reading. I put the quote down. This is clearly someone who believes that the confession of Jesus as the Christ is the rock. And he says, this confession alone provides the church a secure defensive position from which it can repel attacks from the powers of the abyss. And the word abyss, he's picking up on that Hades shield. Um, 
What's also interesting, no connection that I could find, but it's maybe there, the ideas of Hades and Sheol is also a word that um, starts appearing in the book of Jonah. Do you remember that? Because he goes in the belly of the whale and it says he goes down, 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 down. And the way he describes it is that I sunk all the way to the bottom, which is Sheol. And we've talked about this. One of the reasons Jews hate storms on the water is at the bottom of the water is where you start Sheol. And if you sunk down there, they'll get you. Yes, come here. Yeah, yeah, I, I totally forgot about that. But I, I think that kind of uh, encapsulates the whole term because it's a, a Jewish term and Jews don't have the same exact idea of heaven and hell. The idea of Sheol is sort of like the lost souls get ripped off their, not off their person more or less, but like the thing that makes a human a human gets ripped and sent to the depths where there's nothing but death and darkness is kind of the, the idea. Um, where we kind of think of it more in like the spiritual sense. They thought of it in like the literal sense that you are removed from everything life-giving and, and joyful in some ways. Um, any more questions or thoughts before we move on? We've got a fair bit of ground to cover, so let's do it. Verse 21. From that time, so from the time Peter makes his declaration and then Jesus says, don't tell anyone. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples, which I think is important. What he's telling them is to the twelve. That he must go to Jerusalem. And I want, I want you to hear this. This is as simple and straightforward as this can be. Jesus has sort of alluded to the fact that there might be like, he has said like, hey, you'll have to like bear your cross. But he hasn't done it in the context of here is black and white blueprint for what's about to happen. So this is the first time he does this. He says only to the 12, he must go to Jerusalem. So they're at the furthest place possible from Jerusalem, still in Jewish territory. It's actually kind of a pagan Jewish mix. And they are going to go all the way to Jerusalem. And when he gets there, it says, And suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and the scribes, and be killed, and on the third day be raised. Okay, so... If you didn't know anything about Jesus, you've never heard of him, you've never read the Bible before, you're, somebody is like, here is the Gospel of Matthew and you're reading. Is this not one of the most plain scriptures we've read so far? There's not like any interpretation necessary. Jesus says, hey, gather around. No parables, no illustrations. Here's the deal. I'm going to go to Jerusalem. They're going to uh, basically prosecute me or persecute me, or both, right? I'm going to suffer at the hands of those who are responsible for caring for God's people. They're the ones that are going to do this to me, and it's going to end in me being killed. And then on the third day, be raised. It says, plain as day. Um, there's a little footnote there because it's, it's interesting. Uh, many of you know this, but Pharisees believed in the resurrection, uh, Sadducees did not. So for Jesus to say that he would be raised would be uh, automatically, if you were a Jewish convert, there was an issue if you were a Sadducee for the idea of resurrection. Uh, so Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Let's just talk about this for a second. Um, I made a little list of all the times that the word rebuke has shown up in the Gospel of Matthew. Here they are. Jesus rebukes the wind and the waves. Um, let's see. Jesus rebukes a demon. Jesus rebukes the disciples for present, uh, preventing little children from coming to him, which is coming. And then the crowd attempts to rebuke two blind men that are shouting and causing a scene in chapter 20. And now we have this idea of Peter rebuking Jesus. So even before we talk about what he says, let's just talk about how out of line this is. Okay. Let's talk about the rabbi-disciple relationship. How does this interaction, how is this interaction supposed to work? 
We talked about this phrase. I think I even mentioned it on Sunday. A disciple is to sit at the feet, which is to mean you are quietly submissive, recognizing the authority and the wisdom that that person has, and you are... I don't know if they would say this, but I grew up with this phrase. You are to stay silent. You are not to speak unless spoken to, more or less, right? That is Peter's job, and it is embedded in him as part of his culture. So whatever Peter is doing right now is making him feel so strongly that he decides that he is going to rebuke a rabbi, which is, like, dude's head is getting pretty big. Why do you think his head is getting so big? He just got told like the biggest compliment ever, right? I mean, he's also come off like, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt, right? And bro, we're not talking about bread. I can feed 5,000 people, you idiot. But now he's coming off, well, you know, this, this high that Jesus is like, blessed are you, Simon Barjona. So he's coming off of that. It's maybe going to his head a little bit. I don't know. So it says that he rebukes Jesus saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan, for you are a hindrance to me. That's the word where I I told you that uh, in Greek it can be lots of things. Hindrance is a proper uh, translation. But it can also be the stumbling block. Many of your versions have stumbling block. And I just think stumbling block makes more sense with Peter rock stumbling block I just I just think it's a cool wordplay but they didn't pay me to translate ESV so for you are not setting your mind on things of God but on the things of man okay so let's start at the end and then work our way backwards you're not setting your mind on the things of God but on the things of man what is the foundation that this church thing is built on the proclamation that Jesus is Okay, so the very next episode, Jesus, uh, Peter says it. Peter is praised for it. The very next episode is Peter has already forgotten his proclamation. You see that? So Jesus says, you're not setting your mind on things above. If you were setting your mind on things above, you would be hearing this conversation and saying, the Messiah is speaking to me. I should listen. Does that make sense? So he says, you are, uh, you're now back in thinking in the flesh, more or less. And, and how's that going for him? I don't know about you, but the more I read about Peter, the more I ponder and sit and think about him, the more I realize, man, what a great kind of like archetype illustration for me. One second, you are the Messiah. And Jesus says, that's the key to absolutely everything in the rest of your life. It is so true that the entire church is going to be built on it. And the very next, Peter is saying, well, I don't know. I'm going to pull you aside and correct you. Clearly, he's missed who Jesus is now. He's, he's got the blinders back on. So let's, let's talk a little bit about this. Let's talk about what he uh, does. He says, far be it from you, or this shall never happen to you. Um, This is actually the question at the end, but I don't think we're going to have time to get there, so let's just ask it openly. What is at stake for Peter if what Jesus has just described happens? Maybe put yourself in his shoes, not like 2,000 years later and we know the full story, but just put yourself in Peter's shoes in that moment the best you can. What's at stake for him if Jesus goes to Jerusalem? gets persecuted and killed and then raised from the dead? What's at stake for you? Okay, it'll make Peter a target? Yeah, like he'd be all by himself and he wouldn't have his rabbi. His okay. How many of you ever went to middle school? In my middle school, i got to imagine it's similar to you, there was like This was like the core, core cool kids. I grew up in a tiny little town. There's like maybe four or five of them, right? I wasn't in that group. But there's like kind of these stratas. And if you can kind of like hover around here in proximity to the cool kids, you kind of have this sheltering and you also sort of feel a little bit cool sometimes yourself. Does that make sense? Anyone else experience middle school that way a little bit? Peter is lingering and hanging. He is one of the 12. 
he is one of the 12 of like the rock and roll rock star prophet messiah guy who does miracles and everyone's talking about him and it brings crowds of thousands and when they all show up he gets to serve the bread and be like I'm with him right so what's at stake if this happens in Peter's mind what's at stake status is gone so his stock just took a tumble, right? He's also left behind a family business. He's kind of dedicated his life to this. What would happen then? His kind of prospects are back to square one. So there's a lot at stake for Peter. He is heavily invested in, I believe, he's heavily invested in Jesus being a success. Would you agree with that? He's heavily invested in Jesus being a success. And so I think, um, I think there's an element of Peter feeling this in the flesh, that these things are fleshly. Without Jesus, I'm just a low-key, very low middle-class fisherman with no real prospects that's not that smart. Does that make sense to everyone? Yeah. And so... Being that, he speaks out of the flesh, and he says, this, should, this will never happen to you. By the way, even after being called Satan, which we'll talk about in a second, Peter again has a hard time allowing this to happen. Do you remember what happens in the garden? Right? He puts his actions to these words. Right? What does he do? Just lops off a dude's ear. How bad of aim do you have to have swinging a sword at somebody's head and just getting the tip of an ear, by the way? I think that's funny. It's like um, standing in the batter's box and striking out on three pitches, swinging a miss. Um, <laughs> never mind. My mind I literally just thought, I wonder if he lopped the guy's head off and Jesus would have put that back on. <laughs> that's what I thought. Okay. Get behind me, Satan. Some heavy words. He was just told that things have been revealed to you by God the Father. Blessed are you, Simon Barjona. Basically, you have a precedent that the other disciples haven't even landed at. And then a few verses later, Satan. So let's talk a little bit about this idea of Satan. I think what's uh, kind of at the core is Peter's temptation to Jesus. I think it. I'm taking some liberties here, so this is my opinion. This is maybe not what the scriptures 100% say. But do you remember this scene in the garden where Jesus says, take this cup from me? There's this very real feeling that Jesus is tempted and desires to not go through with it. This, this human reaction, when the flesh is rising up, I think what you see in Jesus is this recognition that the flesh does not want to do it. And he's crying out to God. You guys know the scene I'm talking about. I think what Peter is doing is he's actually kind of pushing that button in Jesus. Because what he's doing is, I think, the exact same thing that Satan did to uh, Jesus back in chapter 4. If you had to sum up what Satan is trying to do to Jesus in the temptation in chapter 4, what would you say it is? Oh, you're hungry. Yeah, hunger is a big fleshly thing, isn't it? Other than air and water, those are like the, that's the most important thing. So what does Satan say to him? Those stones, just turn those into bread. Jesus says, man does not live on bread alone. He, he says, all the kingdoms of the world I will give to you if you just jump and worship me, right? If Jesus holds the authority over all the kingdoms of the world, that's a lot of power. I think what Satan is telling him is, whatever God told you, don't even, don't even bother with that. You have the power to save yourself. And I think when Jesus says, I'm going to go to Jerusalem, they're going to kill me. I got to imagine when those words come out of Jesus' mouth, there's got to be this visceral, like, that is the plan. It's sobering. It probably hurts to even say it. And then Peter comes and says, just save yourself. You don't have to bother with all that stuff, right? And his reaction, I think, is telling because clearly, you ever push your spouse's buttons? In a way where you just push it like dead on and the reaction is like, ooh, 
Wrong button. <laughs> Nobody thinks that's funny? <laughs> Nobody wants to go there, yeah. <laughs> you can call the church office if you need to talk about it. <laughs> Don't email me. Uh, Dan yeah, here. <laughs> Just kidding, just kidding, just kidding. Um, so I think he hits it right on the head, and it, and it reacts. Jesus reacts. Get behind me, Satan. You are acting not just in the flesh. You are acting in the way that's the exact opposite of God. You are trying to ruin the entire plan. So I think that's at the, the core of um, of being called Satan. Um, one last thing that I think is just interesting, when he says, you are a hindrance or you are a stumbling block to me, it's just a cool word. Um, the word in Greek is uh, scandalon or scandalon, which is literally uh, transliterated into English, which is one of the few words that is, right into our word scandal. At its core, the word scandal means to basically entice somebody into a situation that is purely bad for them. Um, just thought that was an interesting note that you stumble upon trying to figure out what words mean. Okay, let's head for the finish line here. Then Jesus told his disciples, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay each person according to what he has done. Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Woo! Pretty powerful stuff, huh? Um, from this point forward in the scriptures, um, scholars say you can just draw a big sharp line starting in chapter 17. We are now on the countdown march to Jerusalem. So this kind of bookends an entire section of Matthew. So let's pick it apart the best that we can. Um, I was kind of thinking about this. I actually um, talked to somebody I trust about this idea of taking up your cross. How many of you have heard this before? How many of you have used this before? I've used this lots of times, and I was convicted in the way that I use it this week. Because I was thinking, okay, part of the, the, the desire of my heart to teach the scriptures is to think, what is going on in the first century the best I can understand? And I didn't grow up in it, I don't speak that language, but I have some resources. So what's going on? And one of the first things that just jumped off the page is that this is not spiritual in Jesus' words in this scripture. Does that make sense? This is not like some spiritual image that Jesus uses, and you're like, oh, yeah, 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 I get it. In the Roman world, to take up your cross is what? You have been convicted of a crime worthy of death and a shameful, public, humiliating death at that. So I was thinking, and I was thinking, is there any other way to interpret this? Not out of Jesus' mouth. Because what he's saying to them is, if anyone wants to follow me, this is where you're going to end up. You're going to have to deny yourself. You're going to have to deny your whole ability to save yourself. And you're going to have to take up your cross and follow me. And if you take up your cross and follow Jesus as he's carrying his, where do you go? Literally, where do you go? You go up on the mountain to be nailed to it. So right off the bat, I'm not saying that we can't spiritualize this and we can't use this phrase, but we should be careful of such a heavy phrase that Jesus says. We shouldn't say, oh man, I know you were studying late last night all the way till 11 p.m. for that big test, but Jesus calls us to take up our cross. Might be a loose way of using that phrase. Would you agree? So Jesus says, uh, if you deny yourself and take up your cross in the Roman context, that means that you've got to be willing to die. If you really want to follow me, you need to be willing to die for me. That's sobering. It's also why there are periods of time throughout all the Gospels where it says, like, Jesus teaches something, it's very hard, and then what happens? 
the crowds that were swelling all of a sudden shrink, right? Um, I did a, a little uh, search, tried to cross-reference it a, li a little bit. This is, um, some of these are pretty historical. A lot of them are just Catholic traditional and they take records and sometimes take liberty with history. Sorry, YouTube. But uh, here is, this is footnote 15. Peter and Andrew were both crucified. Anybody know how Peter was crucified? He said, I'm not worthy to get killed like Jesus. Just do me upside down. Let's see. Thomas was killed by a military killing squad who pierced him, four people on all four sides of him, and they all pierced him simultaneously with spears. Philip was cruelly put to death by a Roman politician. I think the, the tradition is that he converted this politician's wife to Christianity, so he killed him for it. Uh, some say Matthew was stabbed to death in Ethiopia for speaking freely about the gospel. James was first stoned to death, and then tradition holds that it didn't kill him, so they had to club him to death. Simon the Zealot was said to have been put to death in Persia for refusal to worship the sun god. Matthias was burned to death. John's death is unknown, but it was thought to be of old age, but not a nice old age because he was in exile all by himself on the island of Patmos. That is what the disciples interpreted as being willing to die for this, and they did it. And then, I don't... I don't know that we have been tested to the point of knowing many people in our midst that have been put to death for our faith. But I think Jesus says that is kind of the end of what I would expect if you choose to follow me. Pretty interesting. Um, the last thing I want to, uh, well, two last things, and then I think we'll just have to wrap up. The first one is this, this idea of, um, let's see, for whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Now, this is really interesting because I'm not 100% sure I get it, but the words that are used for life and soul in this passage are literally the exact same word translated two different ways. Um, it's the word uh, uh, suke, or uh, it's the same uh, word that we get psyche from. Uh, and really what it is, that word in Greek and especially in Hebrew, in Hebrew it's an even cooler word that we've talked about, it's nephesh. And nephesh usually gets translated as soul, but the idea is it's the two combined into one. So sometimes we think of soul as this thing that exists outside of our body. It's kind of like crammed in a body, and then when our body dies, it's like released and it gets to go. But that's not the Hebrew or the Greek understanding. This, uh, just show of hands really quick. How many of you remember what nephesh is? <laughs> Sweet. <laughs> um, Nefesh is a Hebrew word. This is really cool. Nefesh is uh, rooted in the idea of your neck and your throat. Does that ring any bells? And the idea is that every single little thing that you need for life enters and exits through your body, through your throat, through your neck. The air that you breathe. So when God breathes into the nostrils of Adam, it goes through his literal nefesh. When you eat food, when you drink water, it's nephesh. When you worship God, it is nephesh. It's every single thing that animates a human being to be a human being is this. Does that make sense? So Jesus says, uh, for whoever wants to save his animating force, the thing that makes you a human, will lose it. But whoever loses his soul life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man? So to lose your life or give it over to God is, I think, this. Is to turn every single thing that makes you a human, your worship, your eating, your drinking, your breathing, every single thing. It's why Jews, um, they, uh, they believe that the breath of God was literally in their lungs. And so when they had their kind of uh, their life oriented correctly, every breath was worship. Isn't that cool? I think that's, that's the theme. So Jesus says, if you want to gain your life, the entire thing that makes you human, every part of you needs to be turned over to me. And when you turn it over to me, freely saying, I would lose it for you, I will actually give it back to you in its fullness and completeness. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? 
or what shall a man give in return? For the man, for the Son of Man is going to come with his angels, um, and then he will repay each person according to what he has done. Now, I, um, I am guilty in some ways, if I'm just completely honest, of remembering this. Because what I, I would like it to say is that you will be held accountable and you will be judged based on what you've done and believed and said, maybe a little bit of what you've read. Anybody else feeling that way a little bit? I got, I got to tell you, one of the, the huge pitfalls of going to school and learning Bible and stuff is that these belief things that we call theology become front and center, and then you're in these like nitpicky arguments trying to figure it all out. All the while, when you just step back, you're like, neither of us are actually like living lives that are producing fruit for the kingdom. All the while, we're arguing over who believes correctly. Isn't that interesting? Jesus says... I will repay each person according to what he has done. In Matthew chapter 25, the sheep and the goats are gathered, and what does he do? I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty. You gave me a drink. These are all things that you've done. Not, you had a sword put to your throat and they said, do you believe in the Trinity correctly? No, but that's not it, right? What you have done. Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Uh, if you would, I'm going to do my best to just wrap up in the next two or three minutes because I think this is an important chunk. Now, there is some uh, evidence that early Christians read this and what they believed was exactly what it says, that there was some that would not taste death, like they wouldn't be dead by the time Jesus returns. Do you see that? It's kind of a tricky verse. Um, and I, I can't tell you with absolute 100% confidence I know exactly what this means, but I can tell you that I'll do my best. And I, I put a fair amount of time into this. I, I think when he says the Son of Man coming in his kingdom, we have to ask ourselves, when does the kingdom come? When does the kingdom become a true reality that we can experience? When, when is the moment that that happens? The resurrection. So there's this moment, Jesus says, My God, my God, why have you for forsaken me while well, he's hanging on the cross? It says he breathes his last, and then what is the next thing it says? That the curtain in the temple rips from top to bottom, right? And that curtain was separating people from God, the Holy of Holies. So all of a sudden now there's no longer a barrier between God and people. And then, upon his resurrection, death is defeated. And it's not just defeated by Jesus for Jesus. It's defeated by Jesus for all that believe what Peter said. Right? So at that moment, is the kingdom accessible to anyone who believes what Peter said? Okay, so this is my interpretation of this. Um, take it or leave it. My interpretation of this is what Jesus is saying is, there are some who will not taste death. You will still be alive when my resurrection happens. And at that moment, the kingdom that you've been seeing glimpses of when I perform miracles and you see them happen will now be accessible and open fully to you. You could live in the world of sin and darkness, but actually be living a life of light and forgiveness and righteousness even on the earth. Does that make sense? Everybody following? So I think that's what Jesus is saying. Um, some would say, you know, what Jesus is trying to say is that he was going to return and he didn't yet. So there you have it. There's another check it off. This isn't real. Um, some people would say that. And if you go online on Google and you type that in, um, be careful what the source is because they'll tell you that too. Um, I think that's where we're going to wrap up. I put a couple uh, final question and a thought. It's less of a thought and more of a resource. If you're curious about Nefesh, there's a really cool video. It's like four or five minutes. It's the Bible project. It's super cool, animated and narrate, narrated. Um, and it's all about that. Any uh, final thoughts or, or questions as we wrap up? Thanks for bearing with me. We went a few minutes over. Thank you.
Thank you.